Uh, firstly, uh, thank you, Brother Bobby and BGF, and also all other organizations for organizing this uh, talk. And uh, <clears throat> firstly, we'd like to dedicate this for the Triple Gem. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Dhammaya, Namo Sangaya. Today's uh, talk, the topic is discovery of truth. Yeah. So firstly, when you said about discovery of truth, uh, the word itself uh, tells us uh, something that most people are yearning to know the truth about anything, yeah? So if we see the dictionary, when you say discovery, yeah? Discovery is a process or action, yeah? To discover something and uh, things that being discovered. So the process of finding information, a place, an object, or the act of discovering something seen or learned for the first time, or something found, invented, or uncovered, yeah? And normally it's accomplished to a methodical process or probably it's just found for the first time. And when we talk about truth, so how do you define the truth? So we said the quality or state of being true, yeah? Or which is true or in accordance with fact or reality. <clears throat> or a fact or principle, yeah? Principle that is accepted as true. Now, why is it so important yeah, to discover things or to discover the truth? Uh, we see that there are two ways of uh, discovery. One is mundane and one is uh, supramundane. And in a mundane world, yeah, uh, all discovery also leads us to what we are today. For example, if you look at the invention yeah, of agriculture. So it refers to a series of discoveries where, you know, the dom domestication, uh, and also the culture and management yeah, of plants and animals. But what is so important about this discovery? So it leads to profound social changes. <clears throat> and then it helps human beings develop settlements and civilizations and open up <clears throat> more options for survival, meaning longer life and also they can choose uh, a life where they don't have to just depend on hunting and killing so definitely we can see that uh, a human mind can discover uh, many things some are mundane and some super mundane and the, when the discovery is uh, <clears throat> discovered then we human can actually uh, live a better life. Now, another type of discovery is a dis discovery yeah, of truth. So, seekers of truth. Yeah? So, we know that thousands of years, <laughs> humanity has passionately yeah, pursued the truth with a capital T to try to find the answer to the ultimate <clears throat> way of life. Yeah, and about the universe. Yeah, we will be questioning about who am I? What do I want? What is my purpose yeah, in life? And what is the meaning of life? So if you look at our modern life, most of the time we may not be pondering about this until uh, maybe we get into trouble or having some suffering. And then maybe this all question will come to our mind. Now, next, yeah, when we talk about the seekers of truth, we know that the Buddha has spent many, many years to seek for truth. And of course, uh, the search of the Buddha, the Buddha also named it as two kinds of search, yeah, or two kinds of seekers to find truth. Or people think that how happiness can be found. Eh? One is a kind of, uh, the Buddha say is called ignoble search. And uh, the other one is called noble search. So 
<clears throat> through the Buddha's uh, own investigation about life, yeah, seeking for truth, the world found there are two types of search in us. The Moan is an ignoble search. What is this ignoble search? <clears throat> ignoble search means that when we try to find happiness, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> to things that we think brings happiness, but it does not. For example, the Buddha said, you know, I'm of the nature, yeah, or subject to aging, sickness, and death. And if I seek for something or someone that is also subject to aging, sickness, and death, then will I truly find happiness? But if you still go on to such such thing for happiness, uh, then meaning that is ignoble search, meaning that you won't really find that true happiness. Yeah? And for example, we also seek for something like, for example, the Buddha said, reflect, yeah? I'm also subject to stress, depressed, uh, to <clears throat> despair, pain, and also to bondage. And if, if I try to seek happiness yeah, in someone or something that also subject to pain, stress, distress, despair, and bondage, then can I find that happiness? So these are the reflections yeah, the Buddha had in seeking the truth. And, but then the Buddha said, if I can find this yeah, in uh, seeking this way of happiness, then is there any other choice of uh, searching for something more uh, super mundane than this? So what the Buddha had at the time uh, is that the Buddha said, even if I subject, I'm subject to yeah, aging, sickness, and that, subject to stress, despair, pain, yeah, bondage. Uh, <clears throat> then you choose to seek for something that is opposite of it. Yeah? Means subject to aging, but the Buddha seek for something that is ageless. Yeah. Subject to sickness, then the Buddha seek for something that is mm, sickless and then deathless and then unbinding. Yeah? So free from stress, free from uh, despair. So this is where uh, when seeking, uh, it's also important to know what to seek. So the Buddha chose to seek or search for the noble search to discover truth. So we know that the Buddha actually spent many years, even when he was young, up to when he renounced, he already pondered a lot about what life is all about. Yeah? He even asked his father yeah, why people have to go through aging, sickness, and death. And of course, ordinary people, we may not be able to answer this question. And I think during this pandemic, yeah, uh, this question I think is uh, looming yeah, in uh, a lot of people's mind when we are faced with something that is beyond our control and we are shaken yeah, by the reality of life. So back to what the Buddha discovered is that <clears throat> the Buddha said yeah, for human being, as uh, in Pali we say manusa, yeah, uh, we have to know that this is the most precious uh, birth uh, that we can have because compared to any other beings, you can see that human beings have this uh, capacity. Uh, when you say manusa, means mana plus usaha, means the mind can be developed. If you look around, yeah, our search for life, our search for humanity, our search for truth, we can see that human mind is very, very powerful. We, we excavate, we <clears throat> examine, we analyze, and we have this capacity to discover more and more things. But what is important, the Buddha said, is that 
the mind, the discovery of the mind, I think, is the highest. And uh, <clears throat> not only on that, but how to transcend it to go beyond. Yeah? And in Dhammapada, we can uh, understand the Buddha said, mind is the forerunner yeah, of all phenomena, uh, of all evil. If one speak or act yeah, with an impure mind, then suffering will follow us. Mind is also the forerunner of all uh, good states, yeah? wholesome states. If one speak or act with a pure mind, then happiness will follow. Now, what the Buddha has uh, discovered yeah, uh, is unimaginable by ordinary people. Even one day when the uh, Venerable Sariputta, which is uh, said to be the foremost in wisdom, yeah, and uh, said uh, boldly to the Buddha that he knows the Buddha. And, but then the Buddha uh, sort of like uh, tested him to see or to make him understand that to what extent he really understands yeah, uh, the Buddha. Uh, at the end, <clears throat> of course, what a Buddha has realized is uh, such a vast and such a profound, such a deep uh, knowledge and <clears throat> going beyond the ordinary mind. Yeah? And uh, Venerable Sariputta said that he can discern uh, the Buddha through the Dhamma. So now in this uh, sutta, uh, Simsapa Forest Leaves, yeah, the sutta, uh, one day the Buddha actually picked up yeah, a handful of leaves and asked his monks, you know, he said, monks, which one more? The few Simsapa leaves in my hand or those overhead in the Simsapa forest. So, of course, the monk said, the leaves in the Simsapa forest is more than the handful of leaves. But what does it mean? Uh, why the Buddha wants to give them this analogy? <laughs> so, the Buddha actually mentioned to them that uh, whatever or the discovery or the knowledge that he had, yeah, uh, through his enlightenment. The things that he know directly yeah, through his knowledge, uh, direct knowledge, but he has not thought, yeah, are far more numerous from what he has thought. Then we'll be wondering why he is not teaching yeah, all the knowledge that he has uh, acquired or realized, yeah, the direct knowledge during his enlightenment. The answer is because the Buddha say they are not connected with the goal. Means the goal of liberation, the goal of ending samsara. And then it does not relate to the basic principles of the spiritual life. And it does not lead yeah, to this enchantment, to this passion, to cessation, to calm, to direct knowledge to self-awakening, to unbinding. So, for example, like for now, in our modern life, we have yeah, tons of information. Uh, there are so many information about everything and anything we want. <clears throat> but when we learn and we try to find uh, so much knowledge, yeah, so-called knowledge, yeah, but a lot of time is just information, then we still are uh, in that kind of uh, cycle yeah, of getting stress and also going through suffering and satisfactoriness in life. Uh, that is basically because the knowledge or the information that we are gathering or trying to discover may not lead to the goal of our true wishes to find peace or happiness or to find freedom. So therefore, the Buddha yeah, did not uh, teach all these uh, <clears throat> knowledges that he knows because it does not lead to the goal of 
liberation, the supreme freedom yeah, from the cycle of samsara. And it is all, it does not lead to the basic principles yeah, of spiritual life. It means that uplift our spirit, yeah, uplift our life. And uh, it also does not lead to this enchantment means the things that we do, you know, continue to make us suffer. So if it does not lead to this enchantment, then even if we teach them, it doesn't help them. So this knowledge also does not lead to calm. I mean, the more we learn, the more we uh, practice it, the more we get anxious and uh, maybe fearful. So it does not lead to calm. So also there is no, uh, what they call, uh, goodness yeah, to teach them in, in a way that if it does not lead to that, uh, calmness and <clears throat> then also this knowledge yeah does not lead to direct knowledge you know we may have a lot of information we may think about a lot of things but it's still a thoughts yeah which is not directly no so uh, direct knowledge needs those uh, with a uh, contemplation with a uh, uh, mental development uh, meditation and insight yeah so these are the things that uh, when it's not connected to this, then of course the Buddha also don't teach. And when those knowledge does not lead to self-awakening, normally self-awakening will make us yeah, very uh, spiritual and uh, self-empowered, yeah? uh, the way to find the truth yeah? and to ultimately come to truth. And also, too, if those knowledge are not, yeah, uh, lead to <clears throat> free us from enslavement, then the Buddha also uh, do not actually uh, teach. So what the Buddha discovered is this, yeah? The first of the first, yeah? The Buddha said that it's important for us to have a right view. So if we do not have right view, all the rest of the thing that we do in life will be giving us all the side effects of uh, stress and uh, unsatisfactoriness and suffering. So what are the basically some of the right views that we think or that we have? Yeah? For example, the Buddha mentioned, yeah, uh, there's giving. This is right view. There's offering and there's sacrifice. And there's resultant of wholesome and unwholesome actions yeah? and their uh, repercussion. And there's mother and father. We may be surprised. Yeah? Some people don't even uh, think that uh, to refer to their, <clears throat> this right view. There's this world and next world. Of course, there are some people that are materialists. They don't believe that there's this world or next world. They just think we we'll just be happy. And then when we die, uh, Everything finished, but it's not as true. It's a wrong view, according to the Buddha. Yeah? There's this world and next world, and there's also spontaneous birth. Yeah? And there are wise ones who, faring and practicing rightly, has realized and proclaimed the truth. Meaning there's still uh, wholesome people, people who have uh, realized the uh, supreme truth and uh, tell us and uh, guide us to this truth. Yeah? So some people may not believe that, but according to the Buddha, that this is the first thing, the right view that we should have. But ultimately, of course, the Buddha packed all this uh, teaching in none other than the four noble truths. Yeah? Meaning of all the teaching yeah, that he's taught, it is summarized or, you know, in this discovery yeah, of this truth that is called four noble truth. So it's not say any truth, but it's a Arya Satcha, means a noble truth. Meaning this truth, if a person were to learn, practice, and continue to practice and realize, then it leads them to end their cycle of suffering. So what is the first truth? Yeah, so the Buddha said, the first truth is the noble truth of suffering. So we have to understand there is suffering. 
For example, during this pandemic, I think everybody will agree that everyone is going through uh, with a lot of suffering. Yeah? And different people suffer at different degrees. Some suffer more, some suffer less. Some, uh, although they may not suffer uh, what they call physically, uh, but mentally they suffer. Some maybe mentally may not suffer, but physically still suffer from certain illness. So there is the noble truth of suffering. And what is the noble truth of suffering? Again, the Buddha explained in more detail. Yeah? Uh, because the Buddha not only know what it is, but the Buddha is able to uh, give us yeah, all the processes and uh, the way of uh, investigating or discovering the truth. So, so example, the Buddha said the noble truth of suffering. Then we were asked, what is the noble truth of suffering? So the Buddha said, noble truth of suffering. Suffering is where, you know, the first one is that when one is born, there is suffering. Uh, when one grows old, also suffering. Uh, so it means birth, aging, and then sickness. Yeah, Like I said, during COVID time, sickness, yeah. And then death is suffering. As we see the statistics, the number goes up, everybody becomes very panicked. Right? So it is suffering by listening to somebody's death. Also, we feel uh, suffering. Then what next? When we are living yeah, with an unpleasant one. Yeah? In the past, non-pandemic, you know, if you don't like somebody, you can go out from the house. But in pandemic, you have to stay with them. And this is, uh, to a lot of people, truly suffering. Yeah? But they do not know how to come out, right? But this is suffering. So it means staying with an unpleasant one or uh, when a person has to be separated from their loved ones. This is also suffering, the Buddha said. And then not getting what wants. You want to go out, cannot go out. Suffering. Yeah. You want to go and work, you cannot go out to work, suffering. Yeah. And then when you don't work, then you don't have, let's say, enough to support the family, also suffering. Yeah. And uh, many, many different, different things that can cause suffering. So not getting one what wish, but ultimately the Buddha say it's not, not getting what you want means the material part. Yeah? But not wanting to <coughs> get old, grow old, but you still have to grow old. Yeah? You don't want to be sick, but sometimes you just get sickness anytime, especially like during this time. Yeah? And uh, nobody yeah, wish to die, but they cannot escape from death. And so forth about, you know, uh, not living with someone that you love, but living with someone that unloved, or you have to separate from someone that you are so attached to. So all this, the Buddha can explain very detailed. So the first noble truth, the Buddha say, we have to acknowledge and understand there is suffering. Because without acknowledging it, we may not do what is right. Yeah. Second one, the Buddha said, the noble truth of the origination of suffering. So suffering don't just come like that. Yeah? There's a cause to that suffering. So what is the cause to all this suffering? It's none other than craving. So craving about what? Yeah? So again, the Buddha investigate and discover further yeah? all the details of what it is. So the Buddha said, how, why we suffer? Because of craving. Yeah, through our six senses, we crave sensual pleasure. And because we crave a sensual pleasure, uh, therefore, actually, it leads to suffering. Yeah. And, yeah. and then the next one is craving for to become. And the last one is craving not to become. When the, a person do not get what they want, then they crave not to become. And that's why some people commit suicide yeah, due to that. So ultimately, yeah, the main uh, origination of this suffering is craving. But the key thing to the uh, suffering 
although there's not, I've mentioned the seven, but the key main one is that because the grasping of the five aggregates means the grasping of our body and the mind uh, as I, my mind, that it is belonging to uh, the I or my mind is the key thing to the whole mass of suffering. Right? So next, the Buddha said, not only yeah, you, you know there is suffering, you know there is cause of suffering, but of course, when we seek for truth, we will always ask, is there an end to it or not? Yeah? So we tell you this, we tell you that, but the key thing is, is there an end to it or not? Yeah? Because suffering is suffering, right? So we want to have end to the suffering. So, of course, the Buddha said there's an end to it. Yeah? Not just we are telling you uh, there is this suffering, there's a cause to the suffering, but there's an end to suffering. So, at least we know that means end of suffering means is happiness, is peace. Yeah? Means the suffering cool off. So, this ought to be realized, the Buddha said. And the fourth one, the Buddha said, the noble truth of the path of practice eh, leading to cessation of suffering. So, how to end suffering? Then we must also know how to do it, right? So, how to do it? The Buddha actually, uh, after his uh, discovery, he <clears throat> actually uh, put it in a very uh, concise way of for us to practice. How can we end suffering? It's none other by uh, learning and practicing uh, again and again the Noble Eightfold Path. So the no Noble Eightfold Path is the way to end suffering. So the truth of ending suffering, we can say, is by practicing the Noble Eightfold Path until we comprehend it fully. Yeah? So what are these uh, Noble Eightfold Path? The first one, again, come back to right view. So right view of what? Right view of this whole noble truth. Yeah. Next, the Buddha said, once we have this right view, then it naturally will condition our right intention, right thoughts. Yeah. And once we have this right intention or right thoughts, it will condition how you speak. You will speak more rightly, right speech. Yeah. More pleasant, truthful, and uh, beneficiary and also speak in harmony. Then when you have this right uh, speech, it will also condition your actions, your bodily actions. So you will also be performing actions which are more kind, yeah? uh, more respectful. Uh, for example, uh, right actions means right uh, way of uh, doing things that you do not harm, you do not steal, and you do not perform sexual misconduct. Yeah? And uh, from right action, it will condition yeah, your right livelihood. So how you earn your living will also will be influenced yeah, by the way how your view is. Yeah? Then it comes to how you live and earn your money. And next, because of the right livelihood, then you will have, yeah, it will condition yeah, your right effort. Uh, right effort also consists, yeah, that kind of effort to abandon what is unwholesome and to cultivate what is wholesome. And because of that, it will consider, condition your mindfulness in doing things. And in this right mindfulness, there are four parts of it that how we can develop further by developing our mind. Yeah. So more to the mental aspect of cultivation the mind, for example, to mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of our feeling, and mindfulness of our mind, and mindfulness of the Dhamma, means the mind object, yeah, that hinders us from a full comprehension of supreme truth. So this, when we practice well, then it will lead to right samadhi, meaning the cultivation that leads you to experience. Yeah? When the five hindrances is uh, suppressed through this cultivation of mindfulness, and then it leads to the other aspects of our mind that the purity of mind starts to unfold and you experience the direct yeah, joy and bliss and also the one-pointedness of mind that leads you to the pure mind, which is equanimous and bright. So these are the processes yeah, and step-by-step step that Buddha explained. 
to how we can find truth or seek for truth, or we can develop the truth and finally probably come up with the truth. Yeah. So why did the Buddha teach all this? Yeah, this basic uh, truth is because they are connected with the goal. So it also lead us to a basic principles of spiritual life, which is more fruitful than the mundane life. Yeah, and it lead to this enchantment, this passion, cessation to come to direct knowledge. Yeah, self awakening and to unbinding means we are safe from bondage. Yeah. So therefore, the Buddha said, you know, it's our duty yeah, to contemplate, to develop our mind. So in our time, yeah, there are many belief systems, even, even our modern time, there are also certain belief systems. Yeah? Just like in the past, when they said like the ancient Brahmanic hymns, they have come down through oral transmission or preserved in the collection of scriptures. Or even now, we say theories, yeah, scientific theories, all actually claim yeah, uh, with quite like definite conclusion that uh, only this is true, anything else is wrong. And so these are the claims that even today, as we look at our internet, yeah, how the, the news or message or statement is being passed around, it's like everything is like true, other things are wrong. Yeah? And, but when this happened, uh, Buddha said, yeah, it is just like a blind association yeah, for us. Why? Because one person or whether a single teacher or their teachers, yeah, all the, whether it's the creator of a statement or something or a composer. So while receiving information and passing on the information or statement, they think, you know, I know, I, I see, yeah, and this is the truth. Yeah? Anything else is wrong. So the Buddha said it is like a file of blind men, yeah? each in touch with the next. Seems so true, yeah, but the first, the middle, and last does not know and see. So actually, the claim yeah, for truth is actually groundless because why? They do not really know. Yeah, they just pass on statements uh, about the truth. They think it's true. And uh, so, therefore, such kind of uh, truth yeah, or things that we heard is actually the claim is groundless. So we may honor something yeah, out of faith, yeah? whether to oral scripture or theories or internet or social media tradition today. Yeah? But we have to know that this can be blind association because why? We haven't investigated. Yeah? Most of the things we didn't investigate. Yeah? So don't stop at faith or information only. Always have the attitude to investigate, to seek the truth. Now, the Buddha say, even when we are actually yeah, uh, well-born, we may think that we, we are better off with everything and anything about the truth. Or whether we have a very good experience, whether we are rich, knowledgeable, or virtuous, or even a good speaker or a teacher who have many students, or we are honored by... Yeah, those high-ranking people, or even the ruler, the Buddha said, continue yeah, to seek for the truth. And how do we actually seek for the truth? The Buddha said, first, we must understand that there are five things uh, that may turn out in two different ways here and now. What are the five things that may turn out in two ways? Uh, number one is about faith. Yeah? Number two, like your approval on something. Uh, number three, order tradition. Number four, reason cogitation. And number five, reflective acceptance of a view. I think during this pandemic time, we were all uh, tossed around yeah, with uh, a lot of uh, this uh, kind of uh, things that is happening around us. Yeah? And to ultimately find that uh, still there are many things unknown about COVID-19, about you know the way of things that, uh, should be uh, understood until now. Yeah, still search are ongoing. So why we say that we cannot just uh, uh, accept because, for example, whether it's faith or approval or sometimes you know the view that we accept, 
it can be yeah, something fully accepted out of faith, fully approved of, well transmitted, well cogitated, well reflected, but yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. Now, for example, if we just take something to uh, analyze, yeah. Uh, so uh, at this moment, of course, uh, now more and more research has uh, found out that um, the first, of course, they roll out about the vaccine, and then the, everybody also accept out of faith and uh, is fully approved of. Uh, well transmitted all over the world, and then it's well uh, thought of and well reflected. But now they start to find out a more and more uh, reality, uh, there are more and more facts about that. Even after having the vaccine, people can also still get, let's say, COVID-19. And uh, research also, some have shown that uh, those who have uh, uh, COVID-19 and they are Let's say that, for example, their uh, level of immunity yeah, is more protective than those taking vaccine, for example. Yeah? So these are all the new research that come up. And uh, because why? Uh, at one point, of course, that was the ultimate truth about this. Yeah? But now we start to see a different uh, scenario, yeah? different uh, research, uh, different truth that's come up. Yeah? And also that... Uh, we also know that uh, in, let's say, for example, yeah, in Malaysia, we, we also seen that 98% or 99% who got the sickness have uh, uh, been cured or they have no even symptoms, some of them. So the conclusion is that uh, although we have to be uh, careful, uh, but we do not have to succumb to just uh, believing, but we also have to reflect. Yeah? And why? Because the Buddha said also something that can be, you know, have we have approval or faith or we accept it, but it can be also uh, areas that we may not reflect very well, but it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. Yeah. And under this condition, then it's not proper for a wise one eh, who preserves truth to come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. For example, like when things like, when they have a uh, you know, uh, bias towards, let's say, those who have uh, good health and those who have a certain uh, definition of getting a priority to do something, uh, then we may actually uh, mistakenly thinking that uh, that is true, but it can be mistaken there. Yeah? So these are the things that the Buddha said that uh, sometimes we may have faith on certain things or approval on uh, uh, <clears throat> certain uh, view or we reflected, but then it can also turn out to be uh, mistaken yeah? or maybe not so factual. Yeah? Now, there are three ways yeah, the Buddha said that, you know, how we discover truth. But before that, how can we preserve truth? For example, when we heard about the Four Noble Truth, yeah? so to a lot of people, what is this truth? Yeah? So when we say about the truth, we are actually uh, telling people about this particular uh, information or statement or the source of this uh, statement. Then, we are called to preserve the truth, yeah? but we haven't really discovered the truth. And then, not only discovering of truth is just the final, but discovering of truth may not be yet as final until we really comprehend and understood and arrive at the truth. Okay, so what is preservation of truth, yeah, the Buddha? mentioned in the Chanki Sutta, is when one states the source and content of what one believes, eh? then you say, this is my faith. Yeah? This is what I know. But we do not jump into conclusion eh? that only this is true and nothing else. Yeah? And other things is, is actually wrong. So when we uh, can uh, have this type of uh, way of uh, looking or 
finding the truth, then we can say that we are preserving the truth. But we are yet uh, to discover the truth. We may not discover the truth yet. It's just that we know something or information, whether from the internet, from somebody else. Uh, we, if to preserve truth, the Buddha said, we just quote eh, and say, where is the source? What is the content? And this is what I believe at this moment. Yeah? But we cannot say that this is the only truth. So you see, a lot of people may quarrel because of this, because uh, their one is the most true one and others are wrong. Yeah. Then the next one, how to discover truth, the Buddha said. So, like for example, when you learn something, yeah, whether it's a public info or public talk, or whether you get from the internet or somewhere else, then the Buddha said, in order to discover the truth, we have to go further, yeah, further than what the sources of uh, things that we get. So, uh, the key thing is to find out, yeah. Like for example, in the old day, yeah, the householder, and now I put it as a netizen, eh, uh, goes to see the person and investigate him in regards of three kinds of states. So in order to find the truth, the Buddha said, then be first uh, important to investigate eh, who the person actually speaks about the truth. Eh, or the, <coughs> to investigate their states of mind, yeah? whether they have greed, hatred, and delusion. So why is it so? Because it's so important. If that person's mind yeah, is obsessed with the, these three states, so most likely, yeah, sometimes they, not, they do not know, then they might say, I know. They did not see, they might say, I see. Yeah? And he might uh, urge other people to do uh, in a way that lead to harm and suffering for a long time. For example, during this pandemic too, we can see that uh, even some politicians may claim to ask people to use even uh, uh, chemicals uh, that is used for uh, bleach for washing uh, to, to, to bleach a person. So you can see that you know, uh, sometimes when a person's mind is obsessed with greed or hatred or delusion, they can even announce publicly to the world what to do, but they themselves do not know and do not really understand. Yeah? And they, this can actually lead to harm and suffering uh, to a lot of people and for a long time. So in order to discover truth, we have to first you know, investigate on the person who speaks or the person who proclaims. Yeah? So then we will be able to uh, gauge yeah whether this resource is more reliable or not. And then the Buddha said, investigate further. Yeah? So investigate further about the person until you come to know uh, that this person do not have this great hatred illusion. And the next thing is observe. Yeah? Also their behavior, their verbal behavior, whether it's affected by great hatred illusion or not. And so, because when a person do not have greed, hatred, delusion, then the things that they speak, yeah, the truth that they speak will be more profound, more deep, yeah, and it's not so simple to see yeah, because you need the kind of uh, investigation, examination to uh, unfold yeah, the truth. And uh, so the Dhamma that they teach will also be peaceful and sublime. And not just by real reasoning only, yeah, but uh, deep investigation and uh, contemplation. And the things that they teach also will be more subtle and can be experienced yeah, by the wise. Meaning when a person follow the path, then they will be able also to realize. So, after investigation, in order to discover truth, yeah, it is important yeah, for the person after having evaluated uh, the statement that is being proclaimed, the person and the Buddha said, when we find that they are reliable, they are pure in a uh, good sense, yeah, then we start to have faith in him or in them. Yeah? So 
we can uh, so called put our trust yeah in them and because we put trust in them then the buddha said then naturally we will visit them so just like in the uh, our days when we uh, meet someone uh, who is uh, very kind very helpful very wise there's always tendency for us to want to associate with them because we find that whatever they do leads to a uh, good result leads to harmony leads to higher wisdom so we place faith in them and we visit them and because we visit them we also uh, pay respect to them because people who are uh, wise yeah naturally people will also respect them so we pay respect to them and having pay respect to them then we will give ear to listen yeah to what they are saying yeah and because we give our ears means uh, they would actually impart yeah good words or uh, good teaching yeah and this is where we hear the dhamma and uh, hear the truth yeah so having hear the truth yeah then we must also try to remember memorize it and also find out the meanings of the teaching and uh, when we have that then we will gain a reflective acceptance yeah because we find it is so true that's why we will accept yeah so in simple form just now we mentioned the four noble truths yeah so we can see the teaching yeah so what the buddha mentioned about uh the reality there is suffering and uh, what caused it then we can see that because out of uh, greed yeah a lot of people fall into uh, suffering and uh, then we also know that after examine uh, the noble eightfold path uh, how we can we have a right view yeah to uh, overcome the suffering so after we reflect find the meanings then you know we will be able to accept those teaching yeah so having accepted yeah uh, out of uh, reflection then you know it will brings about our aspiration or zeal yeah? or desire yeah? but this one is more a good one yeah to one yeah to gear our uh, energy towards that yeah towards achieving those uh, dhamma those truth Uh, that can help us to grow or help us to find peace or help us to have wisdom so when zeal springs up the buddha say then you will apply your will that means your will power so this will power will lead you to more uh, scrutiny yeah you will scrutinize further meaning you go into a deeper aspects on uh, developing your mind through uh, all the practices yeah from the training that the buddha laid down the threefold training uh, from you know practicing the principles of life uh, basically let's say the five precepts and then to further to mindfulness uh, to the higher uh, development of the mind the samadhi and uh, to all this yeah you will also gain higher wisdom through insight and through that then you continue yeah to strive on again and again and through the resolute striving means you don't just know a little bit and then think that ah this is the only truth yeah and then that is also a mistake yeah there are two kinds of mistake people can do the buddha say one is they never start on the dhamma but one is having start they didn't go all the way yeah so this is where striving uh, for that highest Uh, supreme truth is important and the continuity persistency is very important so that one day the supreme truth can be penetrated yeah with wisdom so only through all this process the buddha say then this is where you say there is a discovery of truth yeah because you went through uh, the process that ground you and leads you to the direct knowledge of how you come to really understand that this a uh, particular let's say practice or this particular teaching or statement uh, is consists of uh, that well being yeah and it leads to that wisdom 
and that freedom. So this is where uh, the discovery of truth can be done. But the Buddha said, we still have not arrived uh, at the final truth. Okay, We just discover the truth. Uh, like sometimes uh, when we say, again, reflecting from uh, the pandemic and the uh, suffering that people went through, then we see that people start to question uh, about uh, why people have to fall ill, uh, why people have to die. So then a lot of people, uh, when they do research, they found that uh, now a lot of people start to want to do self-care. And next, now they pray more and uh, try to develop their mind for more. Because why? Now they realize uh, by lamenting, by you know, blaming, by uh, yeah, putting forth uh, all the unclaimed, uh, all the claim that is not true, it doesn't help. Yeah? People have to come to discover that truth for themselves. So they have to start to do self-care. They have to start to investigate their own mental attitude. So then they can come up uh, stronger, healthier, happier, and uh, you know, uh, freer. So now how to arrive at the final truth? The Buddha said, the arrival of final truth yeah, is actually lies in the repetition, development, and cultivation of those same things. Just now, those 12 steps that I've mentioned. Yeah? And what is most helpful for final arrival of truth? The Buddha said, striving. Yeah? So if there's no striving, no result. No striving, you will not be able to have the final arrival of truth. You may discover truth, but may not have the final arrival of truth. Meaning you comprehend yeah, the truth, the four noble truth. And when you are able to comprehend the four noble truth, that is where the Buddha said you surpass yeah, those ordinary and uh, where a person then uh, attain uh, or the first stage of sainthood yeah, that uh, they now understood yeah, that the body and mind that they think as I and my mind yeah, uh, is actually uh, insubstantial yeah, of any self. Right? So striving is the most helpful for final arrival of truth. You strive until you attain. That's why the Buddha always advised not to rest uh, on a partial uh, attainment. Yeah? So if that one does not strive, the Buddha said, one will not finally arrive at truth. But because one strives, one does finally arrive at truth. So this is so truthful when the Buddha said, you know, uh, a lot of people say, you know, lucky, yeah? to be lucky. The Buddha said, uh, the most lucky person is what? One who's diligent. Yeah. So what else is helpful? So for striving, what is helpful for striving? The Buddha said, scrutiny means we uh, scrutinize, eh? examine the Dhamma and to find yeah, uh, the inside of it. Because of that, that's why we will be able to have the confidence to strive on. Yeah? And uh, what is helpful for scrutiny? We must apply our will yeah, to do it. Yeah? So people say, you know, to learn good or to practice good, uh, it takes uh, a lot of time. Yeah? But to do something bad is very easy. So in order to scrutinize, we must apply our will yeah, to do the, the way or the good things that to be practiced. So then we'll be able to uh, discover more truth about the Dhamma. So for application of will, what is helpful for that? Desire, the zeal, yeah, to want to do it. And what is helpful for zeal? A reflective acceptance of the, <clears throat> the truth. Yeah? And what is most helpful for reflective acceptance of the teaching is a uh, true examination of meaning. So when we know the meaning of each, then uh, it's easier for us to 
accept it because we understand better. Then what is helpful for examination of meaning? First, we must remember what is the teaching, let's say, of the Buddha. For example, the Four Noble Truth. Yeah? And then what is uh, helpful for memorizing the teaching is when we hear the Dhamma. So if we don't hear the Dhamma, let's say, for example, we have plenty of Dhamma information yeah, in the internet, but we can't remember. Yeah? But if we uh, learn yeah, to uh, find meaning, yeah, then we will be able to remember. As, uh, but how we can remember is by listening again and again or reading again and again, and then we can remember. Yeah? We may not remember all, but when we remember all the key teaching, then having heard and read again, we can retain better. So what is helpful for hearing the Dhamma? So the Buddha said, we must give ears uh, to hear the Dhamma. So if you give ears to just hear the song, just hear all the rumors in the internet or YouTube and uh, all those things, then of course, you will never get to the truth. So what is helpful for giving ears? Then they say, pay respect uh, to those who are worthy of respect. And then the, what is helpful to pay respect is by visiting, uh, visiting the person or we can search here yeah, about the person. And then through that, what is helpful for visiting is when we have faith or confidence towards uh, the person or the things that they proclaim uh, that is helpful for us. Okay. So now final arrival at truth is to repeat all the above until one finally arrives at supreme truth. Okay. So this is how we can Discover truth, discover the Dhamma, especially the Four Noble Truths. Yeah? Then the Buddha also in other sutta, Kalama Sutta, advises us. Yeah? So when we want to seek for truth, don't just go by oral tradition or just now in modern time. Uh, don't just base on internet or social media tradition. Yeah? Because why? Remember the five things. It can be approved or be so many people are looking at it or accepted, but it can also be uh, not true. Yeah? And also don't go by lineage of teaching. Yeah? And nowadays, there are a lot of uh, gurus yeah, in the internet too. But we have to also uh, know how to investigate and to find the truth. And don't just go by hearsay. Yeah? Now it's even more challenging where you have all the hearsay and news feed of uh, uh, what you call, uh, they call it uh, the conspiracy theory. Yeah? It's even uh, more uh, the teaching that uh, confuse people, yeah? that make people fight. Yeah? So it's all the hearsays. And uh, don't also go just by a collection of scriptures. Yeah? So it's good to synchronize and to study and reflect, discuss, investigate, examine, and then practice, and then reflect, yeah, and uh, get into the insight to see whether it's true or not, yeah, and don't go just by logical reasoning, so this one is especially when you see how lawyers argue in the court, yeah, and we can see in Malaysia scenario, yeah, uh, not only we have COVID cluster, but we have other kind of cluster, uh, and uh, this is where uh, reasoning uh, in a court can sometimes uh, be fake too, yeah, because people just make up certain things. And then by inferential reasoning, not just merely by our reasoning or the thoughtful reasoning, or by acceptance of view, yeah, after pondering it due to our personal uh, preference, or by you know, uh, just looking forward, oh, because uh, it's a good speaker, yeah, but we also have to think, yeah, and investigate so that. Uh, not only we investigate, we put it into practice, some of the good teaching or some of the teaching, and then we will finally come to the truth. So what is the criteria for us to really uh, look at things in a simple form? Yeah, it is, <clears throat> the Buddha always also teaches how we can uh, evaluate yeah, whether a person is uh, have a, uh, uh, spiritual or not spiritual, uh, the easiest way to evaluate is to see that looking at a person, when 
there's a greed in a person. So the Buddha asked, does it arise for welfare or for harm? So in conclusion, when a person is greedy or aversive or deluded, and they are overcome by greed, aversion, delusion, and their mind is possessed of greed, aversion, and delusion, then there's tendency for them to harm living beings, uh, to steal and to take without shame, and to go after other people's uh, wife or daughter, and to tell lies, and to induce others to do likewise. So all this will lead to long-term harm and suffering. So this is where we can see if uh, a person is obsessed by this, then we will know that uh, to seek the truth from them is, of course, uh, won't lead us to, to truth, yeah? to happiness. So the Buddha said, you also know one for yourself. Yeah? You can reflect. If these things are unwholesome, blameworthy, and essential by the wise, and if these things accepted and undertaken lead to harm and suffering, then we should abandon them not to follow and not to, not to accept, not to follow, and not to do it. Yeah? But if you see yeah, this non-greed, non-aversion, non-delusion, then it's for the welfare. And when people have this kind of uh, mind, then they do not yeah, harm others. Yeah? They will be generous. Uh, they will be respectful, contented. They will actually speak truthfully, and beneficially and harmony. And uh, so they will also encourage people to do so. And this is where it leads to welfare and happiness. So this also you will know, not say that people tell you and then uh, you just believe, you too will know. Yeah? So when you know that it's blameless, it's wholesome, it's praised by the wise, then you accept it and undertake it then it will lead to your well-being and happiness. So you should live by them. So uh, how else can we extend this yeah, of uh, truth is that when a person do not have greed, hatred, and delusion, or they are, this greed, hatred, and delusion is actually under control, then they can also practice a divine living by uh, practicing metta, karuna, mudita, Upika, meaning, you know, always uh, uh, in uh, good awareness to uh, spread uh, not only the thoughts, yeah, but also the good action of goodwill, compassion, altruistic joy, and equanimity. So during this pandemic too, we find that, you know, uh, there are a lot of people too having this uh, good practice on the generosity on kindness to help those who are in trouble or are suffering from the sickness or suffering from loss of job. Yeah? And uh, we also see that we have to face this pandemic with equanimity. Yeah? And at the end of the day, we know that we have to live with uh, what is true, that the Buddha said that yeah, sickness and death is uh, inescapable. And uh, this is where that we have to understand and do what is important in life so that we'll be able to spend our human life, a short human life of probably 80 years old, uh, to do what is best in our life and uh, so that we can uh, live in a good way, in good view, and uh, to strive for the final liberation. And uh, so spread out this uh, <clears throat> divine abiding um, you know, immeasurably, yeah, by as we practice, then we will be able to yield the result too. So we can see that in the uh, Buddhist uh, uh, endeavor, eh, we know that in summary, we can say that, you know, even to recollect on the truth, on the Dhamma, uh, the Buddha always encouraged us, yeah, uh, to explain or to. Uh, to teach the Dhamma yeah, in a complete way. And also, this Dhamma can be seen immediately. You don't have to believe. Yeah? And uh, also, whether in the past or now, this Dhamma also tells us the truth. Uh, for example, we say Four Noble Truth. Yeah? In the past 2,600 years until now, this truth still say yeah, as the Noble Truth. Yeah? 
then it always invites us yeah, to investigate. So in the Buddhist teaching, uh, investigation is one very important thing. Yeah? Uh, as a seeker of truth, uh, we need to investigate. So examine and uh, put to task, evaluate, and to finally arrive at truth. Yeah? So when we do this, it will naturally lead us to liberation one day. So this teaching, that the Buddha say, this Dhamma, this truth can be understood yeah, by the wise one individually. So if everyone walks the Dhamma way, then one day they will come to this truth. So today I offer this for your reflection and for your practice and wishing all uh, be well and happy and to discover the truth of the Dhamma for your spiritual well-being and the well-being of the many. Thank you. Thank you, Aya, for your very uh, inspiring message and a very meaningful message, very comprehensive message. Aya, there's a question from uh, Mudita. Mm -hmm. Good day, Sayale. During the pandemic, caring by visiting through calls or video call be better than physical visit? Well, during the pandemic, like we said, eh? Uh, of course, in the sutta, we hear about uh, physical uh, meeting. Yeah, uh, of course, that is still the best. Yeah, to to help or to search for the truth. But in the pandemic situation, we are also subject to um, some SOPs and uh, for prevention. Yeah, and uh, so the call, of course, to internet uh, is helpful. We say it's helpful uh, to undertake uh, certain uh, inquiries or certain even like teaching or counseling. Uh, I think that is the best way for this condition. Uh, but nevertheless, there are cases that uh, if in need, uh, still like you see that in hospital, no matter what, yeah. so even it's crowded, see people are going to hospital, right? So uh, we have to see uh, on the case-by-case -case basis, uh, but of course, we are all subject to the rule or the governor's, uh, what they call rules in certain things. So we have to adhere accordingly. So, but teaching on the internet, uh, there are pros and cons too. Yeah? We can uh, look at uh, how people study in the, to, to, uh, the online. Yeah? So sometimes the word can be uh, because of the transmission is poor, sometimes the words that people catch can be also mistaken. Yeah, and so at this moment, of course, we we said uh, still we are practicing, but uh, many countries are already opening. Yeah, because after looking at the uh, when we investigate the data, and I'm I believe you know, uh, even scientists, uh, all those people who are in charge of uh, managing uh, the pandemic. Uh, they have seen that uh, the best have been done. Yeah? And the uh, data also shows that about 98, 99% yeah, of people actually recover. But uh, vaccine has been rolled out. Uh, measure has been taken, but it does not stop. Yeah? So uh, just like in the past, uh, even during the worst time, eh, the pandemic, uh, during the uh, Probably like spiritual, uh, this uh, Spanish flu, uh, also until today, yeah, it, it still exists. Yeah? So sooner or later, yeah, there will be a conclusion on that, yeah, that uh, people will be back to uh, normal life. Yeah? So teaching, education, I think uh, physical uh, teaching is um, more comprehensive because you can see the person in all over, yeah. So, like, let's say, for example, in a shrine, when you teach, people don't just simply walk in and out. But in online teaching, let's say, people will walk in and walk out as they wish because it's at their own private comfort to do what they want to do rather than the attitude of learning, yeah, in a full condition. That's why we say there's office, there's a class, you know, it's specific, dedicated for uh, learning or working. And then the person can actually focus and give the best uh, during that time. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. 
Thank, thank you, Aya. For those who are listening in through Facebook, kindly post your questions in the comments on your respective Facebook pages. We will have uh, volunteers copying the questions and putting it to Aya. So uh, Aya is a firm believer in face-to-face. Uh, -face. On the 23rd of October, Aya is having a Katina ropes offering, uh, which will be face-to-face, -face, but uh, the maximum number has already been reached. But uh, those who are interested, uh, kindly contact uh, us for Aya's uh, Katina. So the next question, Aya, how can we maintain the motivation to practice the Dhamma when we don't see results, especially in meditation? Mm. So this is very uh, important, yeah. Uh, Buddha keep mentioning is that remember when Ananda when Ananda asked, you know, um, the half yeah, of uh, the life is a spiritual friendship. Yeah? But the Buddha said, no, the whole of holy life is spiritual friendship. So meaning right association is very important. Yeah, right association. Even when we we think that we know something or when we practice meditation. And then we get nowhere, meaning that we have not referred to a teacher yeah, to guide us. Yeah? So we think that, let's say, by reading, uh, by going to the internet to learn how to meditate, then we know how to meditate, right? Meditation is not such. The word meditation now is so loose. Yeah? Some people say, uh, they, when last time they asked, uh, oh, yeah, can, uh, can we uh, meditate and listen to song? Uh? Is that meditation? So it's too loose. Some say what? Dancing meditation. Yeah. And you know, so the meditation, that word in modern time is so loose. What the Buddha mentioned, the Buddha mentioned bhavana. Bhavana is not meditation per se as today. Eh? Bhavana means very specific, eh? mental cultivation. You are cultivating your mind. So like, for example, you say, I am stuck. So the mind is stuck, right? Doesn't move, uh, develop. To higher knowledge of wisdom. So therefore, we still experience a lot of, let's say, you know, anxiousness, worries, and all those things. That is because we didn't do it right. Yeah. So the best, right association, just now, yeah, how to seek for truth, analyze. Okay, which probably person or teacher or venerable or uh, uh, meditator teacher uh, that you analyze would be able yeah to explain to guide you yeah uh, in this particular development of your mind so it's good to have that right associate so then as you practice you must check your practice so uh, <clears throat> dhamma or meditation teacher will be able to point to you where is your hindrance where is your obstruction and then they will teach you how to overcome that obstruction yeah so when you are able to overcome don't uh, underestimate. Huh? Even small little obstruction can actually stop you from developing. Uh, some, they, at the beginning, when they meditate, it's very good. So they achieve something. Huh? Achieve means realize some knowledge. And because they are overwhelmed by their, uh, that uh, realization, which is not, of course, not enlightened yet, but you know they realize direct knowledge on the mind, yeah? and then they become overwhelmed by it. Then because of that, you see that the uh, subtle aspect of the cause of suffering will come in where you know, they start to crave to want to have that same experience and that's where they don't progress anymore. Yeah? So they get stuck into th that level. So this is also an uh, obstruction. So uh, in conclusion, it's important yeah? to develop the mind. Uh, it's important to have right associate whether it's a right associate with a, a, a teacher of Dhamma uh, or meditation teacher, or uh, uh, then you can have uh, that kind of uh, connection to check your practice. So that is how we uh, progress. So you just apply even the, the steps uh, that I've just shared with you, the 12 steps to discover truth. So the truth through finding the direct knowledge through your meditation. So it's definitely good. You have start something on that. Yeah. Besides, like we say, doing dana, yeah, which a lot of Buddhists have been doing that. And then uh, practicing, let's say, the principles of life, the five percent. Some are doing it well, some are yet to do it. And then the next stage is to do 
yeah, bhavana. Yeah, so bhavana is to practice yeah, uh, the right effort, especially right effort in the abandoning the unwholesome uh, states of mind and to cultivate wholesome states of mind and in meditation, especially mindfulness. And mindfulness itself, we know that there are four, uh, the satipatthana, mahasatipatthana, and each of it uh, also have different uh, ways to, to get into the practice. Yeah? So by reading alone, they will involve a lot of thinking. In meditation, actually, you know, we unwind all those thinking, but we go directly to the experience, yeah? to what is. So this is where uh, a lot of people may mistaken it, like meditation, you know, I can learn from internet, I can learn from the book. Yeah, it's not so. So it's good to have the uh, right teacher and right association for your uh, development. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Aya. Very, uh, very true. What is uh, right association? The problem is most people do not have uh, direct connection with a monk or mm. a Sangha member. The next question, Aya, uh, from Sister Siuling. My son is going for higher ordination next week after being a novice for one year. Please advise during your higher ordination, what do you wish your parents to do anything for you? I think uh, for a person who go for higher ordination, of course, again, I will say, you know, when the first thing is uh, getting the teacher who uh, will be able to guide. Yeah, and uh, for the parents, of course, it's very fortunate. Uh, I think you should rejoice with your, yeah, your son's uh, going forth. And because why? He is going for something wholesome. Yeah? And uh, if he, he is uh, with a, a teacher who is skilled uh, in Dhamma knowledge and in meditation, uh, then, of course, he will be able also to penetrate into the higher Dhamma. So... For parents, I think the most important thing is since uh, the sun is going forth, then we look back at how much we have practiced yeah, the Dhamma too, so that we will be able to benefit yeah, from this uh, supporting the going forth of our sun and uh, for them to be uh, at ease for cultivation. Uh, a lot of people, when they go forth, uh, a lot of parents are reluctant to let go. Huh? So sometimes they always remind the son, you know, to come back, you know, to always visit them. Uh, that again is a craving, yeah. Uh, because when uh, they went forth, we as parents, we give our full support, yeah, to uh, give them that uh, uh, opportunity, yeah, uh, to cultivate further. Because uh, they may not uh, just benefit the parents, but they are going to benefit yeah, so many people. Yeah, and uh, for the Buddha Sasana too. Yeah? So to be able to offer a yeah, uh, son to the Sasana is a very meritorious deed. So you have done the, the best that you can. So rejoice and uh, accept, like I say, uh, if there's any advice from the Upajaya teacher that what to uh, prepare for, then you can consult them. Uh, so because there's a different tradition. Maybe they have a, a different lineage. Eh? They may have a slight different, uh, what they call, way of uh, ceremony. So you can check with them and uh, find out and then what best can be uh, offered to them. So basic is, of course, the, the four requisites. Uh, you can also rejoice by offering to the teacher who has kindly accepted him to become his uh, disciple. Yeah, and also for the new uh, bhikkhu, for their, what they call, for requisite to support their practice. Yeah. So always give them that kind of assurance yeah, that uh, you too will be taking care of yourself yeah, while uh, in support of them. Yeah. So uh, not to worry. And uh, just to share with you, even my, when I went forth, uh, my parents, yeah, uh, rejoicing with that going forth. So for us, then it is such a blessing because we free our mind from the worry of our parents, yeah, knowing that they are taken care of, they have their four requisites, and we have peace of mind for cultivation. All right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you, Aya. Mm -hmm.
Next question, Aya. How can, can we use deaf contemplation on a daily basis to arouse a sense of urgency and motivate us to practice? Mm. Well, uh, <clears throat> contemplation of death uh, is one of the contemplation that the Buddha actually encouraged. Yeah, indeed, the Buddha advises us to contemplate uh, these five realities of life. Number one is um, of, uh, I'm subject to aging yeah, and have yet uh, to overcome <clears throat> decay. Yeah? Second is I'm uh, subject to sickness and also yet uh, to overcome <clears throat> sickness. Yeah? Third, I'm also subject to death, uh, to die, and yet to overcome death. Fourth one is everything that I own, cherish, and love will one day be separated from me. Fifth one is uh, karma is my inheritance. I'm heir of the karma, uh, born out of karma, related to my karma. Karma is my refuge. So these are the five contemplations that is good to com contemplate every day to remind ourselves. Yeah? Um, in a simple form, you see, death contemplation, uh, some Chinese, uh, they think it's taboo uh, to think about death, but not so. We should actually contemplate on death because simply it's a reality. Yeah? For example, let's say in Malaysia, you know, if you reality, we look at it, in Malaysia, average people only live about 80 years old. This is a reality, you know? but we think we have a long life. Okay? And uh, when we think about that, then only we will be able to live more fruitfully because knowing that it's so short, eh? let's say we are 50 years old now, left 30 years, right? And left 30 years, then the one third is for sleep, then only left 20 years, then one third for eating, doing chores and everything, and another one third gone. So left only 10 years. So although we may have, let's say, 80, but in reality, we only have about 10 uh, ten years time to cultivate spirituality. So with that contemplation, then only we also realize that we really have to really put effort into every moment that we have to live uh, mindfully and to develop our mind further to comprehend the wisdom for liberation. So that contemplation, yes, can be done every day. And uh, you can contemplate in a few steps. Yeah? For example, you say, you know, uh, death is inescapable for anyone. Yeah? Everyone that comes to this world will one day end in death. And second, you also can reflect that, you know, uh, as each day passes, you know, my life is actually nearer to death. Yeah? And third, you know, because of that, there's an urgency to cultivate because it's so short time. You know? Every day, the spiritual practice timer uh, is shortened and shortened. Yeah? And then fourth, then you can reflect, uh, do I still, you know, uh, I mean, uh, very attached to this body because this body is very fragile. Yeah? Anytime, you know, it can actually break down to sickness and to death. Uh, fifth, then you also can uh, contemplate you know, do I still actually, you know, attach to a lot of things? Yeah? If yes, then you learn to let go. Yeah? And uh, also, you also reflect that this body yeah, that I cling to, yeah, when death comes, it also cannot help me. So the most important thing is to help myself to develop the mind. That is the only thing that I can uh, train. And that is the only thing. Uh, whatever actions I do yeah, with, with my thoughts, my speech, and my body action, I focus on the pure mind. Yeah? So to develop the pure mind and to uh, restrain from the unwholesome, uh, the impure mind. So in that way, then we can live more fruitfully. Yeah? Not just because of that, then it's a taboo. But when we think about that, then we live more fruitfully now. All right? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Aya. Uh, last question from Sister Yen Jin. Mm. As a working mother, sometimes it is really hard to find time to practice meditation. Sometimes only when doing some household chores, like without thinking, able to catch time for meditation, like ironing clothes. 
can this be called meditation because really mind relaxing mm. you see when we said meditation yeah so i still remember uh, somebody a businesswoman asked uh, ajahn cha yeah? i remember this statement yeah? and he asked ajahn, uh, ajahn cha asked him whether he, he she got meditate or not and he answered she answered He said, as a business woman, where got time to meditate? Yeah? Then uh, Ajahn Chah asked her again, uh, can you breathe? Then he said, of course, I'm breathing every day. Right? And then uh, Ajahn Chah told her, if you can breathe, then you can meditate. Yeah? You see, the very important method of meditation yeah, is if you look at the Maha Satipatthana, yeah? And most of the meditation tradition will start with this, what they call anapanasati. Yeah? So anapanasati about what? About breathing, in-breath and out-breath. So of course, when you breathe, in-breath and out-breath, most of the time, yeah, we forget that we are breathing. Yeah? And uh, if we can bring our mind uh, to know that we are breathing, that will be good enough to start. But most of the time when I say breathing, then they start trying to impose, uh, uh, what do you call, control their breath. That is not. Yeah? To know that you're breathing in and out, then that is the way of the practice. Yeah? To know. It's not like try to control your breath or do not know that you're breathing. Yeah? So this is where uh, we can meditate actually in any place, any time. But of course, it's always good to cast out some time. We take three meals a day for the body. We take care of the body so much. But what about the meal for our mind? So if we take busy, then we are only taking uh, so much time for the body, but we didn't take care of our mind. But just now, like I mentioned, yeah, uh, the body at the end have to be laid down. The mind is the one that we need to cultivate. So then, you know, in whatever state of our life, it is taken care of. And whether in this life or in next life, it's taken care of. So we must yeah, allocate time yeah, for uh, this uh, cultivation of the mind through certain method of practice. So you can practice anapanasati, but like I said, again, it's good to refer to a teacher to learn, to know how to do it properly. And then next one, of course, we call it satisampajana. Satisampajana is where you can uh, exercise yeah, through your Uh, clear, clarity of the mind yeah, and uh, awareness. Yeah? Then when you expand your this awareness to whatever actions that you do. So just now you say, okay, if let's say ironing is your best time for you to relax and no thinking, but just ironing, uh, that is also a way of practice, is it? Yeah? To uh, be fully aware of what you're doing. So that is contemplation on Uh, trying to comprehend uh, every activity of the uh, body. So you can practice uh, while washing, just washing. So when you're working, just working. But always remember to allocate time because each person are given the same time, 24 hours. So what is important and what is priority in life? So then we uh, allocate accordingly so that we don't miss anything uh, that is essential in our life. Yeah? The Buddha said it's just like when you Know that if, let's say, death can come anytime or unexpectedly, it's just like a person's hair is on fire. So what will you do? Actually, our life is just like on fire, you know. Yeah? Anytime, like during COVID time, huh, you hear somebody here, your friend, uh, relatives, uh, so-and-so, they just caught uh, COVID and then uh, they're sick or whatever, then they just die. So imagine the brother say, you know, If the, the hair is on fire, what will you do? So, of course, straight, you know, you'll be exerting, finding ways, very uh, determined, you know, and the uh, undivided mindfulness, you want to put off that fire, right? So, so too, the Buddha say, you know, if we understand, then we will actually find a priority yeah, in our life to do what is important, yeah? So, of course, we say we need to earn a living. Yeah? We need to take care of the family. But remember, find time. So, the best is early in the morning when everybody is still sleeping. So, sleep early, wake up early, allocate that half hour, one hour every day to do your 
uh, proper sitting. Yeah? Because during that, then only you know whether your mind is scattered or not, whether the mind can be calm down or not, whether the mind yeah, can be trained or not. Yeah? So that is how you can uh, gradually, day by day, improve it yeah? and develop it. So uh, I would suggest, like I say, allocate some time and also then you can do mindfulness in every activity that you are doing. And that also remember, as you do something, remember always incorporate metta. Yeah? As you do, don't too immerse and then until your head is like tight. Yeah? So as you do, remember to smile. So as you smile, you are actually breathing more naturally. All right? So you can help yourself to, to, to do that kind of uh, direct practice uh, yeah, in your life. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Aya. Very practical instructions. Aya, can you please uh, end the session with sharing of merits and uh, making some aspirations with us? Thank right. you. So we thank everyone for listening to the Dhamma and uh, <clears throat> with all the Kayanamita and with all the merits the crew. May this merit continue to pave way for you to grow in strength and in a confidence in the Triple Gem and in all your right effort to abandon what is unwholesome and unskillful and to cultivate and develop all the wholesome states and skillful states. So be able to have a higher knowledge and higher wisdom to penetrate into the profound Dhamma that leads to the ultimate liberation. May this merit also be shared with all your family members, relatives and friends, wherever they are. May they too be inspired by your good practice. And may they too one day walk the noble path. We also well wish that with all our good practice, may we also be a source of inspiration and kindness for other people. And may our community also be blessed with right knowledge, right wisdom and right skill to overcome with whatever challenges that may arise in their life. We also will wish that our country and the world be stable and be in harmony. Our rulers and leaders rule and lead righteously, wisely and compassionately. And may there be due season for good weather and good harvest again for all. And may all beings be well and happy. Now we shall also share this merit with the devas, and also dedicate this merit for the spiritual well-being of our departed relatives.